Hi everyone, thanks for stopping by Peace Garage. In this video, we're gonna talk about sticking stuff together. Now, I really don't want this video to be a lesson in chemistry, so I'll keep it as simple as possible to help you choose the right adhesive for what you are trying to accomplish. And in order to do that, there are a few things to keep in mind and that I wanna go through. First of all, what is adhesion? Uh, secondly, what different types of substrates might require a different type of adhesive? And finally, where do you go to find technical information about the adhesive you're gonna buy to make sure it's correct, not only for the substrate that it will stick that you want to make sure that it has the physical properties so it will it will withstand it'll have the durability for your application do you it will it be too stiff you don't want it to fracture do you want it flexible do you want it to be uh extremely hard those kinds of things we're going to look at but first in order to make this video i want to do some research and make sure that i was sharing relevant information for most people first i went into autozone and they had a nice little section with adhesives and sealants and they were broken up adhesives they said were epoxies we're going to talk about that in a second and then sealants which they labeled as thread lockers then i went to home depot and they have a nice section and theirs are divided up by epoxies and super glues which are cyanoacrylates underneath the epoxies and super glues they had all the regular glues glue is derived from natural plant and animal resources while an adhesive is based on synthetic products. I know it's a technicality, but if you watch my videos, you know that I get hung up on technicalities. Now, first, the thing that struck me and the first thing that made me stop and ask a question was when I was at AutoZone. And I looked at the sign that said adhesives, and right next to it in, in small letters, it said epoxy, and right next to that it said stronger than super glue. So since they made such a bold claim right there on the sign, stronger than super glue, I started to think to myself, stronger? Stronger how? There are probably 10 to 15 different physical properties of cured epoxies and adhesives that you can compare one another that, that might, be, it might be good in one area and not in good as a, in another area. There's, there's tensile strength, shear strength, elongation, compressive strength, dielectric strength. There are so many different physical properties just to say epoxy, stronger than super glue, I think is misleading. And this is what happens when you go in a store. You have to rely on the signage, the marketing, to try and point you in a direction to buy something. And this is the first thing I saw that was kind of a stumbling block. So I went and checked it out. So here you go. So here we have some information right from the technical data sheets. On the left is information from the technical data sheet for 3M 2216 epoxy, which is similar to JB Weld, a little softer. On the right is right out of the technical data sheet for the Henkel Loctite Super Glue. And here's the charts. So I picked a common characteristic, which is really common, which is a shear or the overlap shear strength, which is when you glue two pieces together and you try and pull them apart. So let's take a quick look at them. On the left for epoxy, uh, we have 1850 for the gray. The, the 3M comes in three different colors. Uh, the gray, which is thin, tan, which is very thick, and a translucent. So for the gray, our shear stress or shear strength is 1850 to 2350 to tan. And for super glue, it's 290 to 1600 on etched aluminum. So in this case, yeah, epoxy wins for shear strength. So let's go down and look at something else. For steel, uh-oh, it looks like steel might be starting to lose it here. Our shear strength for the 3M epoxy, the, the uh, Scotchwell epoxy is 1700 for the gray, 3100 for the tan, but super glue has 2500 to 3500 PSI. Interesting. Let's look at something else. ABS plastic. The epoxy has a shear strength of 990. That asterisk means the material actually broke, so it might be stronger to 1140. But ABS for super glue was 1000 to 1300. And let's look at something completely different. Polycarbonate. Polycarbonate's a strong plastic. We have 1170 for epoxy. 1,000 to 1,600 for super glue, and something that's really common. 
neoprene, rubber, that kind of thing, onto steel, nitrile, rubber, anything like that. Epoxy, 220. Super glue, 150 to 290. So even though I walked into the store, walked up to the material, looked at the heading, and a, a sign that said epoxy, stronger than super glue, I went and looked up the information and I could not find information that proved that epoxy was stronger than the super glue. Now it could be in certain areas, there are certain properties that are important and we're going to talk about it because it, the super glue will not stick or adhere to certain materials like epoxy will. They have completely different characteristics and we're going to talk about that. Now the first thing that caught my eye right underneath that sign were all the JB Weld products that were available which was a, quite a big variety and I decided to take a closer look at it. First I looked at something called Plastic Bonder which I found interesting. It comes in two colors. It was black and a tan and I said what could be the difference be? You look, you look at the front and all the characteristics are the same but what's the difference to, between the two? So I flipped them over and this is what I found. The back of the package said the Plastic Bonder was a quick setting two-part urethane adhesive system that provides strong and lasting repairs and work on thermoset Thermoset plastics, carbon fiber composites, thermoplastics, coated metals, concrete, and more. Plastic bonder. The other side of the label had all of the applications and usage like plastic and PVC. Well, PVC is a plastic. Fiberglass, concrete, metal, wood, tile, ceramic, auto, home, industrial. It covered a lot of stuff. So it turns out the plastic bonder is not a material to bond plastics. It's a material made out of plastic. So it's a plastic bonder, not a material for bonding plastics. Which is deceiving because you could walk in thinking I have some plastic I want to buy in a bond and you grab that thinking it's going to work, ends up not working. I also looked at the SDS or the safety data sheet for the plastic bonder. The safety data sheet for any chemical, whatever chemical you buy, anywhere you buy it, there will be two forms available online that you should go and look at. One is the SDS. The safety data sheet contains all the information you need to know about how hazardous the chemical is, what you can do to prevent uh, injury, how to protect yourself, uh, what's in it, who makes it, where it's made, a lot of uh, legal terms in there so that you can go and make sure that you're using the material safely. The second one is called a TDS, it's called a technical data sheet. That's the sheet where you would go and find all of the performance, the cured performance characteristics, characteristics for a material to make sure it's going to perform the way you want it to or do what you need it to do when it's cured. So anyway, I looked up the SDS, the safety data sheet for the plastic bonder JB Weld. That shows the chemicals are in the in both parts and I looked at the chemical composition of that and there were not any chemicals in there that would, let's say, promote adhesion between the, ad the adhesive, the epoxy, and the substrate if it were plastic, which I think is, was odd because it's called the plastics bonder, but there aren't any chemicals in it that would actually bond to plastic. That's why I say it's deceiving. I thought it was a little bit misleading, so be careful when you choose something and you go and grab it off a shelf. Make sure you're grabbing the right thing. Which brings us to the first thing we want to talk about is adhesion. Now it doesn't matter if we're talking about adhesion of paint on metal, uh, paint on a urethane bumper, uh, trying to glue a piece of aluminum to a piece of plastic, it doesn't matter. Adhesion applies to all kinds of materials where you're trying to stick two things together. Now there are five basic mechanisms of adhesion. They are mechanical, chemical, dispersive, electrostatic, and diffusive, where mechanical and diffusive being the most common. So when you glue something together, you think you just put some glue between two parts or two pieces of something and it dries and, and, and it's just going to stay together forever. That's not entirely true because adhesion, how it sticks, what is making those things stick together is extremely important. First, mechanical. If you're going to glue something together that has a lot of pores in it, like concrete, wood, uh, a, a, a piece of metal where you roughed it up with some sandpaper, something that has some open pores, the material, the adhesive, is going to flow into those cavities or into those pores, and when it cures, it's going to mechanically lock into those pores. When it mechanically locks into those pores and cures, now you have a mechanical connection between one substrate and the other with the glue being in the middle. Next is chemical adhesion or chemical bonding. 
and we're going to take you back to some of your chemistry class, organic chemistry, talk about covalent bonding. The chemical bonding or chemical adhesion is when you have two atoms. Let's say we take, I don't know, let's say we take two hydrogen atoms and chemically bond them with an oxygen atom. We get H2O, we get water. Uh, compounds are made of, uh, uh, materials made of atoms. Those atoms are put together, you know, covalent bonding, or are stuck together uh, electrically through the atoms to form another compound. So you take an element, put it together, and you get a compound. That's, that, that's chemical. So you have chemical bonding or chemical adhesion, a little different than the mechanical. Next is dispersive adhesion. And this basically occurs when you have something that's charged slightly positive, something that's charged slightly negative, and they attract together and they just hold together. So there's an electrical connection that holds them or electrical adhesion. This is very common. You might see it when water sticks to a leaf or something like that. That's what we talk about when we're talking about dispersive, dispersive adhesion. Next is electrostatic. And I'm sure we've all experienced that. Electrostatic adhesion is, is very simple. Uh, if you're going to wrap a present, let's say, and you take some cellophane tape and you pull off a piece of tape, and as soon as you pull that off, you're, you're charging that with electrons, and you go up to the wrapping paper, and as soon as you go to put it on the wrapping paper, the wrapping paper gets sucked up to the tape, and now you have a piece of tape exactly where you don't want it, so you've got to throw it all over and start again, trying not to get the tape to stick to the paper. That's electrostatic adhesion, electrons trying to be exchanged between two materials, and they want to be stuck together. Electrostatic adhesion. The final type of adhesion is diffusive. And this is a little more common when you have a couple plastics and it's almost like melting them together. They have to be dissolved and then they are melted together at the cellular level. And this is done with the use of a solvent. Now solvents come in two kinds. There are aromatic and aliphatic. And the difference between the two is aromatic solvents are like methane, propane, and butane. Aliphatic are like benzene and toluene. Those solvents are chemicals that will break down the structure, the surface structure of a material, and soften it so that the, let's say the pores open up of a polymer, like a plastic, polystyrene, a poly material. So you have a polymer, that solvent breaks down the structure, it opens it up or it softens it up, and when you put those two together, the solvent, let's say the solvent promotes a mixing of the two materials and once they're together and the solvent evaporates the two parts become one part very common like if you've ever built a plastic model like that that kind of glue it has a solvent uh, I said glue but it's, a, it's an adhesive uh, it's, even though it's called model glue it's an adhesive because it's all chemicals there's a solvent in there that uh, the, dissolves the polystyrene plastic it's like a ethyl ethyl ethylbutylene or something like that. That's the chemical that dissolves polystyrene. When you dissolve the polystyrene, the pores open up, it allows them to become soft and um, like original state, and the pores glue together, they become one, and it's almost like taking butter. If you take butter and put warm water in there, if the warm water was adhesive, the warm water would, would melt the butter, and then the, the molecules would go back together. Once the warm water evaporates, it cools down, the butter would become all one part. So that's what we talk about when we're talking about diffusive adhesion. The two parts actually become one. Now this is the part where you have to understand what you are trying to glue together in order to select the correct adhesive. There is a thing called high energy and low energy surfaces. High energy surfaces will use a adhesive that uses mechanical bonding. And when you have a low energy surface material, that is when you're going to have the diffusive bonding. It's a low energy material, so it has to be melted in order for the adhesion to take place. With a high energy surface, it'll be mechanical. Here's a simple chart to help you understand the difference between a high energy surface uh, metal, a high energy surface plastic or high surface energy plastic and a low surface energy plastic and where you would need the different kind of adhesive. High energy surfaces are like metals. Copper, aluminum, zinc, tin, lead, stainless steel, all that stuff. Uh, glass, porcelain. They're high energy because there are many, many free electrons at the surface that will allow the transfer 
of uh, electrons so the bonding can take place. Same thing with plastics. You can see the, the uh, joules that are available per meter squared for uh, a metal surface for 1103 for copper, uh, 840 for aluminum. Those are very high. That means that an epoxy is going to stick very easily to those types of surfaces. Same thing with plastics. Plastics are substantially lower. You can see that uh, a Kaplan, uh, the industrial films are at 50 and phenolics are at 47, nylon 46. We start getting down to ABS around 42, polycarbonate 42, PVC, rigid PVC 39 and acrylic at 38. Those are still considered high surface energy plastics where epoxies may stick to them, but it's not going to be optimum. Uh, but those surfaces, epoxies will stick to. Then you look at the low surface energy. These are lo low surface energy plastics are polymers which are very thin and have very few uh, electrons available to exchange for to make the bond. Uh, polyvinyl acetate at 37, polystyrene at 36. I already mentioned polystyrene, acetyls, polyethylene, polypropylene, going all the, all the way down to PTFE at 18, polytetrafluoroethylene at 18. Very, very low surface energy, which means there isn't much for the uh, adhesive to grab to. So you're going to have to melt the surface in order to get some adhesive strength or something to add adhere to that kind of surface. So let's say I had two pieces of aluminum and I wanted to glue them together. Uh, these are high surface energy parts. The aluminum is a metal has a high surface energy at 840 and with proper surface preparation and when I say proper surface preparation I mean what does the manufacturer of the adhesive recommend as proper surface preparation? For 2216 epoxy, if I go to my technical data sheet, it will give instructions where it says to clean with isopropyl alcohol, IPA, then to abrade, then to clean it again with IPA. If I do that, the surface is properly prepared, or I could bead blast it, whatever, I have to get that grit on there, then clean it with IPA, put the epoxy on there, and Put them together and let it cure and I will have a properly cured surface. Proper surface preparation is critical to adhesion and it's different for different materials. If it's porcelain or glass or concrete, you might have to etch it with an acid. If it's a steel or a metal, you might have to braid it or bead blast it. And if it's a plastic, rubber, butyl, that kind of thing, you might have to soften it with a solvent. But always go to the technical data sheet and follow the manufacturer's recommendation for surface preparation. Now, you don't need to put a ton of epoxy on. More epoxy, more glue does not mean better adhesion. I know this is going to be really hard to understand or hard to grasp for some people, but I've run many, many tests on this and proven this time and again. The maximum thickness, really, to get proper adhesion for epoxy is five thousandths of an inch. You don't need a big glob of epoxy in there to hold this together. Adhesion occurs at the molecular level. The more epoxy you put between the parts, you're just wasting more material and giving it more chance to break. Five thousandths of an inch. Five thousandths is very small. Now in case you don't know how much five thousandths of an inch is, check this out. Right there, in between those two, is five thousandths of an inch. I'm going to pull this out of here. That right there is five thousandths of an inch thick. You can barely see it. Just for reference, a human hair is about two and a half to three thousandths. That's five thousandths of an inch. That's, that's the amount of adhesive you need between two pieces of material. It's barely wiping it on, and you put that between those two. If you do that and secure it, you will have a proper bond and it will reach the mechanical properties as indicated in a technical data sheet. So now, let's say I want to take it, that same piece of aluminum and I wanted to glue it to polystyrene. Polystyrene, which is a low surface energy plastic like this plastic cup, if I wanted to join these two together. I could epoxy it, and if I put epoxy on there, they would stick. But it would not take much to peel the epoxy from the polystyrene. I would not have good adhesion, is what we're talking about, adhesion. That's because uh, polystyrene requires diffusive adhesion instead of mechanical adhesion, okay? In order to get the diffusive adhesion to polystyrene, I need to put a primer 
or an adhesion promoter on the polystyrene, much like you would put an adhesion promoter on a bumper, on a uh, ABS or a, a urethane bumper, you need to put an adhesion promoter on the polystyrene. What that does is, it's a liquid primer, just like regular primer, it comes in different colors. When you put that primer on the low surface energy plastic, it melts into the plastic. Then it provides a surface for the mechanical bonding between the high surface energy part, high surface energy primer that is diffuse bonded or a diffusive adhese adhesion to the plastic. If you're going to try and bond a high surface energy and a low surface energy part, you need something to enhance or promote that adhesion, and hence the name adhesion promoter, that has a chemical in it that's going to work with the high, a low surface energy part. And you have to look it up because not all plastics that are low surface energy melt using the same solvents. You can look it up and uh, there's information available, available to you. So let me show you how to look that up so you know what you're using or what to use on a low surface energy plastic to get something else to stick to it. Where do you find technical information? How do you know you are choosing the right adhesive or the right adhesion promoter for the substrate you're using? First, you have to know what material you have. What kind of plastic is it? There are many ways to determine that, uh, but um, you should know, there, whatever you're buying, you should know if it's a urethane bumper, what, whatever the uh, material is, there, you should be able to find out what it is. But once you know what that material is, all you have to do is do a simple search for what melts that kind of material. And, and if I, for, for example, if I was using a urethane bumper, I would just do a web search on what melts urethane. And the solvent for urethane is acetone. Acetone is part of the ketone families, acetone, toluene, xylene, those kind of solvents are going to melt into urethane. So I have to go and find an adhesion promoter that has toluene, xylene, acetone, sometimes it has all three of those, sometimes it has MEK, methyl ethyl ketone, there will be a ton of chemicals in there, but it has to have at least the solvents that are going to melt, so I can chemically melt and etch, chemically adhere to the substrate. When you find an adhesion promoter, now they're not all the same. All you need is the manufacturer's name and the part number and the, the name of it, select seal, whatever it is. Go and do a web search and say uh, Polyvance uh, bumper clad coating 6701. And then after that type uh, TDS and SDS. You want the SDS, the safety data sheet, because that's going to tell you what chemicals are in that uh, adhesion promoter. And when you look at the chemicals, as you scroll through, there'll be a section there that shows the active ingredients and the components. And if you see toluene, xylene, uh, acetone in there, you know that that adhesion promoter is going to melt and chemically adhere to your low surface energy plastic and provide you a good surface for your epoxy or whatever else you're going to use to your high surface energy part. That's very important. So go and look up your TDS, your technical data sheet. That'll show you all the mechanical properties of the epoxy. Now I looked up the TDS for um, what, what was it? Uh, J, uh, JB Weld. Everybody said, well, you got to use JB Weld on everything. Well, here are some interesting things about JB Weld. If you look at the technical data sheet for JB Weld, uh, you look down on the front page and it has a property section with the test method. For example, flexural strength, whatever that means, uh, 3960 PSI. I go down, I look at the sheet. Oh, it says flexural strength here according to D790 is 7320, that doesn't ma match. And again, if I go to the beginning, adhesion strength, according to ASTM D297, supposed to be 3960 PSI. But when I go down to this, adhesion strength, according to D297, is only 1800 PSI. So even though the technical data sheet has information on the front page, it's very high level, and it doesn't match with the actual data that's in the sheet, which is confusing. Now that can happen from time to time. And don't worry about that because I have spoken to, I think almost every major chemical manufacturer. Uh, I've spoken with the chemists at 3M. 
I've spoken with people at Loctite, Hankels, uh, um, Creighton, uh, big, big chemical manufacturers because I have found problems where the material, the, the material itself, the canister or whatever it comes in, the, the information on there does not match what's in the technical data sheet. Uh, I can think of one example where I received a material and right on the label it said store, the freeze it basically, store at minus five Celsius or keep it in a freezer. But the technical data sheet said store it at room temperature. So which one was right? I spent a month finding the right person and I think it was Hankel Loctite. I had to talk to this person and I asked him which, which is correct, which way is right. Well, that person didn't know. They had to actually go into the lab where the scientists who designed this stuff are and they told me that the scientists actually store it in a freezer. So the label is correct but the technical data sheet is wrong so they had to correct it. I've probably done that about five or six times where I found a discrepancy between the material and the data sheet and I had to end up changing one to the two. So just because it says something on a data sheet doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's right. So it's, it's kind of sad in a way but if you think about the kind of the information you have to keep up when they modify formulas constantly to try and go out and change every data sheet in the world that you might find, it's kind of, kind of not uh, realistic. Now the other thing is this. Last thing we're going to talk about is hardness. And when you're choosing a, a, an adhesive, the hardness is really important. In this case, if you look at the JB Weld hardness, there's a Shore D hardness rating there. JB Weld on a Shore D hardness scale has a hardness of about 85. If I compare that to the 2216 3M epoxy, the gray has a Shore D hardness of about 50 to 65. The tan is harder, 65 to 70. And the translucent is much softer at 35 to 50. Here's a fairly good reference for you for the Shore hardness scale. Of course, depending on the scale you're using, the 00A or D, with gummy bears being down at 10 for super soft. But on the bottom, the Shore D scale starts at 0, 10 being for a tire tread, uh, a shoe heel being around 30, sharpen car, a shopping cart wheel being around 50, and a hard hat being around 80. So if you think about how hard a hard hat has to be to protect your head, the JB Weld is harder than that. And that doesn't necessarily mean better, because the harder something is, the more brittle it becomes, which is why JB Weld that has the metal added into it, sometimes it's aluminum, uh, depending on the material, uh, that's why it's easier to machine because it's hard like a metal. It's not soft. You, you can maybe uh, maybe that tan, the tan 3M epoxy. You might be able to machine that. It's not going to work that great. But the harder the material, the higher it is on the Shore D scale, the denser it's going to be, and the easier it can fracture. It's more brittle, just like super glue or cyanoacrylate. If, when, when, when it's cured, it's crystallized, it's very hard, and if you hit it with a hammer, it's going to crack. You know how some hard plastics are? You hit it with a hammer and it cracks? Well, adhesives are just the same way. If I take an epoxy that has a hardness of JB Weld, and it's like 85, and I put it in a flexible situation, it's going to fracture because it's so brittle. Whereas the 2216 epoxy that I use a lot of, I use the tan, uh, I use a lot of the gray because it comes in the small... Uh, this is the small two-cylinder pack. I can put that in the gun uh, and it's ready to use. I can put the, and for a hard to reach spots, I put that pre-mixing tip on there, which is just a mixing tip. And when you squeeze it, it automatically mixes and it dispenses mixed epoxy. So I use a lot of the uh, 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 gray 2216 3M epoxy for a lot of applications. On the Cobra, I bought big tubes of it and I dispense it through a tip so I can glue on the inner liners, glue on those kinds of things, and that's the same epoxy that I used to put the aluminum L bracket on the inside that holds the louvers on the side. Because that epoxy on a properly prepared surface, the aluminum, and a properly prepared fiberglass will adhere and I can ensure that it's gonna stay there. It's not like a low surface energy and a high surface energy like I just talked about. That's how you choose your epoxy. Now, it'll remain a little soft, and I'm gonna throw one bonus fact in here about the JB Weld, and this is one thing that kind of bothered me. As I was looking at these, the display of all these adhesives at uh, AutoZone, uh, there was a huge assortment of JB Weld. And one of them was, there was a high heat, and then there was a marine, 
and then there was uh, another one, and I was like, high heat. Now, regular JB Weld can go from five to 600 degrees. It's good for, five, for just regular JB Weld. This packaging for high heat said good for up to 550. And I'm thinking to myself, why would I want to buy high heat JB Weld that's good up to 550 when normal is good from five with peaks up to 600? And then not only that, JB Weld right on the packaging says to be used for marine applications. Why do they need a separate product and call it marine epoxy? Well, we know what the answer is. It's all about marketing. It's all about niche marketing. Someone's with their boat. They need epoxy. I walk in. Oh, it's a marine epoxy. I'm going to buy that one. That's how you make more products out of one chemical and make it apply to more and more applications to sell more of it. I have a bigger product line. It's all the same chemical, but I'll just call it something different and focus on one of those physical properties and call it this is flexible. This is has more tensile strength. This is a marine grade. This is high temperature. It's all the same stuff. Depends on what specification you're focusing on, what cured uh, trait that you want to focus on a market. I think it's kind of crazy. Anyway, tons of stuff about adhesion. Uh, I love talking about the topic, as you probably tell, can tell already. But if you have any questions and, and you need help, I'll try and help you. Um, like I said, check out the TDS and SDS, find out what the chemicals are made for, how to properly prepare the surfaces, and how thick you need to apply it to obtain maximum adhesion without putting globs at all over the place. You don't need globs of, globs of adhesive to achieve the maximum strength potential of that material once it's cured. Thanks for stopping my Peace Garage.